A Victorian steam train waiting to pull out of the station here at Douglas in the Isle of Man for a journey through the island's beautiful countryside. It's just part of an extraordinary heritage of vintage transport that the island still possesses. Along with this railway there are horse-drawn trams and an electric tramway built in the 1890s and still running today. These railways aren't museums though, they still run much as they've always done, continuing to serve the needs of the Manx people and the tourists alike. They are, though, only a small part of what was once here. For at the turn of the century, the Isle of Man was experiencing a period of boom and expansion, the like of which it had never seen before and has never seen since. At that time, there were cable cars in Douglas, a marine drive tramway south of the town, and elsewhere, a pier railway, a miniature Glen railway, and various hillside car systems. So what was the cause of this expansion? And perhaps more importantly, what financed it? Well, for the answer to those questions, and for the start of this story, we should go out onto the seafront here at Douglas. Even today, a hundred years on, these terraces of hotels present a marvellous sight with their brightly coloured facades and detailed decorative work. And they, of course, provide the answer to the island's sudden burst of prosperity. As social conditions changed, especially in the north of England, more and more of the working class people were able to afford modest annual holidays. And one of the in places to be at the turn of the century was the Isle of Man. Each summer the steam packet boats would bring hundreds of thousands of people into the island from the ports around the Irish Sea. It was just like going abroad, but you had all the comforts of home and more when you got there. 
It was this guarantee of annual income that brought forth the local entrepreneurs and financial investment from the north of England and built these hotels, theatres, dance halls, amusement arcades and all sorts of novel transport. Across the harbour on Douglas Head, which was eminently fashionable in those days, there were all sorts of attractions. There was the Douglas Head Incline Railway, which had two cars that carried visitors up and down the side of the head. It was opened in 1900 and ran until 1954. And looking out over Douglas Bay, there was the Grand Union Camera Obscura, a miracle of Victorian glass and lenses which still survives today. Visitors to the head might have attended a concert party and they would certainly have taken a ride along the coast on the Southern Electric Tramway. This magnificent gateway is all that's left of the tramway today. It was closed in 1939, reflecting the changing fortunes in the island's holiday industry. And some years later, the tracks were pulled up and a tarmac road laid. In its time, though, it provided a spectacular ride along the coast, clinging precariously to the cliff face. And, as the small amount of archive film in existence shows, some breathtaking moments on bridges. Back in town, and at the southern end of the promenade, is the Jubilee Clock. And it was from just here that another tramway started. It was the Douglas Cable Tramway. Opened in 1896, it ran regular services up Victoria Street and round the upper part of the town. Film taken in 1919 shows just what Douglas was like in those days, with the cable cars running in the centre of the street. Visitors crowded everywhere and the shops, with their white canopies to protect them from a sun which always seemed to shine, were doing a roaring trade. Here at the head offices of the Douglas Corporation Transport Department, there's a small transport museum, and it's here that you can see one of the Douglas cable cars. It's actually a reconstruction made up of parts from two of the cars, but it gives a perfect impression of what they looked like. They were pulled along by a wire cable which ran in a conduit under the centre of the track. This cable, which was some three miles long, was continuously pulled round by a huge winding mechanism at the depot. To start the cable car, the driver would have used this mechanism here. The once was a wheel which he'd have turned or used this for extra leverage. This had the effect of bringing the jaws of the gripper underneath the road together. They caught onto the moving cable and pulled the car along. To stop, he simply released the gripping mechanism from the cable and applied this brake here. Just outside the car here, there's a cross-section of the track, and that gives you a good idea of how the gripping mechanism fitted beneath the road. These outer rails carried the wheels of the car, and between these inner rails, the gripping mechanism dropped and gripped onto the cable, which ran in the conduit underneath. Every few yards along, you would have found one of these yokes, which kept these inner rails apart. There was also another system of braking, along with the ones on the wheels, a slot braking system. And that had the effect of applying two brake shoes on this inner rail, and that was used in case of emergency or on the steepest gradients. Pioneered in San Francisco in 1873, the cable car principle was quickly overtaken by the developments in electric traction. And in 1896, when this line was opened, the cable car was already becoming obsolete and the Douglas system was one of the last to be built anywhere in the world. 
The cable cars ran for the last time in 1929, and these buildings, which were once the car and winding sheds for the system, are all that's left to remind us of them today. The marine tramway and the cable cars may have gone, but there's still plenty here to see on the Isle of Man from that golden age of transport. So let's go back to the promenade and see what's there today. The bay at Douglas is one of the finest anywhere in Britain. Its long majestic curve is fronted by the Victorian and Edwardian hotels and they look out across a broad promenade to a sandy beach and beyond. And it was on this promenade in the last century that a horse-drawn tramway was built. Meet Rocky, one of 53 horses that pull these trams up and down the Douglas Promenade each season. Over the years, they've given pleasure to literally millions of people. They started in 1876, and of the 51 cars that have been used on the line over that period, 23 are still in use today. The trams run from Derby Castle at the northern end of the promenade right along the seafront to the Jubilee Clock and back, a distance of three and a quarter miles. Most of the tramway as we know it today was completed between 1876 and the 1890s, and over a century later it's still here, a testament to its engineer and builder, Thomas Lightfoot, a civil engineer who had come to the island to retire in 1870. The rolling stock is run on a three-foot gauge. And over the years, four main types of cars have been used. There's this sort, the open toast rack car, which seats between 32 and 40 people. There's the bulkhead or roofed toast rack, which has a canopy and open sides. There's the winter saloon and the double decker. Most of the fleet acquired over the years was built in Birkenhead the early ones by the Starbuck Car and Wagon Company. They were well built, combining strength with lightness, something I'm sure the horses appreciate. Oak or ash was used for framing and pitch pine for the underframing, the best of timber in all cases. The basic construction has four wheels with two axles and four bearings, an underframe and a body and brakes on all wheels. They're also fitted with lifeguards and side wheel guards. In 1908, all the cars were fitted with foot gongs, and they're operated by the driver from the front here. The brakes are operated by the driver using this lever here. To apply them, he simply turns it like this, and this tightens up a chain which brings the shoes into contact with the wheels. To release the brakes, he releases a pawl from the ratchet with his foot and turns the lever the other way. This slackens the chain and the car is free to move. The horses actually have some quite difficult traffic conditions to cope with on the promenade. Not only are there hundreds of cars, but there are also coaches and buses edging their way through. And in the months of June and September, thousands of high-powered motorbikes come to the island for the road racing. But the horses have very placid temperaments and they seem to take it all in their stride. They're even getting used to the traffic lights. The sole remaining double-decker car is no longer used, but it's kept here at the Corporation's Transport Museum. Inside, there was comfortable accommodation, but the place to be, of course, was on top. Not only could you take advantage of the bracing sea air, but you also had an opportunity of peeping into the first-floor bedrooms of the hotels as you went past. On top here, there was a knife-board seat, and these boards were for the modesty of the ladies. The double-decker carried up to 44 people, and in the early days, when there was only a single track down the promenade, a pair of horses would have pulled it. But from the 1880s, when a double track was laid, 
it was found that two pairs of horses couldn't pass each other, so one horse had to do the job. As the early photographs show, they usually had quite a load to pull. The trams run at night, and for that purpose they have low-level side lights, which are powered by a battery. But that's the only concession to electricity. Communication between the conductor, the driver, and sometimes the horse is still by the old-fashioned whistle. The top of the horses' hooves and the rattle of the trams is a sure sign that summer has come to Douglas. And when it does, another transport oddity starts to operate in a side road off the promenade. This single car lift was built in 1927 by Wadsworth of Bolton and it runs from the promenade here up to the Falcon Cliff Hotel, high on the cliff above, which was built in the 1880s as an entertainment complex with superb views over Douglas Bay. The lift runs on a gauge of five foot and it has a counterweight which runs underneath it. One for the top. Thank you. This little lift is just the sort of thing that visitors to the Isle of Man loved. And there were many such novelties here. Hillside railways, moving chair escalators and the like, many of them sadly no longer with us today. Though one late Victorian miniature railway at Gradle Glen, just north of Douglas, has recently been restored by enthusiasts. And it's hoped that one of the original engines will soon be steaming along the two-foot gauge track once again. But of all the systems, there's one which, even today, stands out above all the rest for its sheer size and technological achievement. It took advantage of all the latest technology and indeed did a good deal of pioneering work itself. It made use of a form of energy, the potential of which was still being discovered. And we can see it today at the northern end of the promenade, just by the horse trams.
That newly exploitable power was, of course, electricity. And although much of the work being done with it at the end of the 19th century was still experimental, its potential was obviously enormous, not least in the field of electric traction. And so two men came to the Isle of Man, Alexander Bruce, a Scottish banker, and Frederick Saunderson, a civil engineer. And they realised a dream, to build an electric tramway, starting from here at Derby Castle. In the last decades of the 19th century, the area at the northern end of the promenade was being developed for the growing tourist industry. Derby Castle itself was built in 1847 by a Major Pollock, originally as two residences, which he let to visiting gentry. In the late 1880s, Derby Castle was developed into a pleasure gardens. And later a theatre was built and a large dance hall. And by 1886, the horse trams were running the length of the promenade to the gates of the Derby Castle complex. And it was from here that the electric tramway was to start, forging a new route north along the eastern coast. Much of the original rolling stock from the 1890s is still in use today, and it's one of the pride and joys of the Isle of Man. The tramway runs from Douglas northwards through the village of Laxey to the northern town of Ramsey, a distance of some 17 and three quarter miles, with a branch inland from Laxey to the top of the island's highest peak, Snaefell. The tramway was built remarkably quickly. It was started in 1893, and within a year it was already carrying passengers on the first stretch of track. By 1898, all the considerable engineering and technical difficulties had been overcome, and the line was through to the outskirts of Ramsey and to the top of Snaefell Mountain. From the very start, it was highly successful. On a good day, it would carry up to 10,000 passengers. In 1895, 80,000 a week. And in that year, combined figures for the electric railway and the horse trams were a staggering one and three quarter million passenger journeys. In fact, in those halcyon days, it was the practice to get the horse tram to Derby Castle, buy your ticket for the electric railway, and then to get the horse tram back along the promenade to the end of the queue. One of the many problems the builders of this tramway had to face, and by no means the least, was the fact that there was no public supply of electricity on the Isle of Man. If you wanted electricity, you had to generate it yourself. And that's just what they did. On their land, just up from the Derby Castle terminus, they built their tram sheds, workshops, and their first power station. The 60-foot chimney that once stood at the side of the yard marked a pair of Galloway's boilers that took water from streams that ran down the brews at the back. The boilers were 20 foot long and 6 foot in diameter. They supplied two 90 horsepower Galloway vertical compound engines, and from their 9 foot diameter flywheels, leather belts drove two Mather and Platt dynamos, giving an output of 100 amps at 500 volts. As the line expanded, further power stations were built, and also battery stores, which offered extra current should several cars be pulling off at the same time which might have overloaded the generators. The overhead cables were themselves sufficient to distribute the DC current for the first couple of miles. But as the line was extended, feeder cables were run underground and up the poles to distribute the power. The whole system is earthed back through the car and wheels, onto the track and into the ground. By 1895, the company was supplying electricity for the nearby Derby Castle complex, for the Douglas Bay Hotel just up the road, and for what was to be the first electric street lighting in Britain. In that first year of 1893, 
the company bought three cars and six trailers. Two of those cars, numbers one and two, are still operating today. And that probably makes them the oldest electrical vehicles still in regular commercial use anywhere in the world. Electric traction was still in its infancy in 1893, and no traditional design for electric cars had been established. And these first cars, built in Birkenhead by G.F. Milnes, were really like elongated steam tramway trailer cars with two electric motors fitted. With them came the trailers, which were in effect lengthened open horse cars on light bogies. The cars were beautifully built, though, with every attention to detail. Those first three cars were open at either end, and the driver was exposed to the elements. But this was remedied in the cars that were ordered in the second year. The general design was also improved upon and quickly became more sophisticated. And this electric railway helped to set the trends and formulate the designs that became standard throughout the world. Nowadays, there are 24 cars and 25 trailers in operation on the coastal section and six cars on the mountain section. Most of the rolling stock dates from the period 1893 to 1906. Well, with me here is the Chief Rolling Stock Supervisor, Darrell Gribben, and he's going to show me something about how to drive a tram. Hello, Darrell. Hello. Well, this is the controller that the driver operates. You've kindly taken the front plate off. Can you take a bit more off so we can see what goes Certainly on Certainly can. We'll take the deflector section off. This is used to stop any flashback of current between all the finger points on the controller. Right. Which, as you see, that's... Made that isolates of, each part. Yeah, it's an asbestos-based yes. deflector section. Now, the controller on the top here has uh, various markings. I think you can put it from this one into forward or reverse, is that right? Yes, that's right. That's the uh, reverse and barrel. So we put it in the forward position. And then what happens as you move off, as the driver moves on? As we move off, we put the, the first point on, we bring in the trolley point, the resistance one, and the earth points. So in fact it's working on the principle of reverse resistance if you like. When you're static you've got maximum resistance and as you turn the controller you're reducing it. You cut the resistance out, that's correct. One thing I haven't asked you is how many motors do you have on a, on a car like this? We have four motors on a car. There's two in the Douglas end bogey and two in the Ramsey end bogey. They go from the Douglas end, we number them one, two and the Ramsey end three, four. Mm. They're linked up that number one and number three are wired together, linked together, so we always have power. If you, if you have a fault on a tram, you've got power to both bogies. The air system is a straight line system, and underneath the tram we have a compressor, a reservoir tank, a brake cylinder. The compressor pumps up air into the tank to 100 pound pressure, and as we apply the brake here, put a bit of brake on, it draws the air from the reservoir through these pipes into the brake cylinder, which applies the, brake, the air to the mechanisms underneath the, the levers. And that's the distinctive hissing sound we hear when the cars start? That's correct. Just demonstrate that for us then. That's letting the air off as the car moves away. And finally, you've got that lovely whistle on the front. How do you operate that? That's on a, a foot pedal, which is... Air, air supplied as air well. Air supplied. Well, Darrell, you've got uh, car 20 out for us here. We just have a look at a few of the details on it. First of all, the coupling. How does that work? Well, if you'd pass me the bar, please, I'll show you. Right. Thank you very much. This bar is a uh, slot one end and a hole the other end, the hole fits to the trailer. Mm -hmm. The buffer, we lift the tumbler, put the bar in, which has a tongue, fit it into the tongue, pull the lever back down, and that's it coupled up. Now this looks like um, a cow fender underneath. Is that a regulation, is it? That is regulation, yes. Do you pick much up on that? Fortunately, no. <laughs> now what's this pipe here for? This pipe is... When we use the winter trailers, we couple this up to the similar pipe on the winter trailer 
and that supplies the air through from the tram to the trailer. So when the tram is braking, the trailer is braking. So in fact the compressed air goes through there? That's correct, mm. yes. Now, uh, around the side you can see what, the uh, brake mechanisms? Yes, on one side there's the compressor and the brake cylinder, and on the other side there's the reservoir tank and the resistance. They're quite hefty bogies, these, aren't they? Yes, they're uh, about 1,300 weight per motor. Any idea how much a car like this weighs? I think they're in the region of about 12 ton. Mm. Now, what about bringing the power down from the overhead cable? What, uh, it's direct current, of course. It's 550 volts DC current. Uh, it comes down through a trolley wheel and trolley pole into the tram to the automatic switch. And, of course, that can be isolated by the driver? That can be isolated, yes. Well, Darrell, thanks very much for talking to us. I'll let you get back to the workshop now. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. The earliest cars were originally fitted with bow collectors for the electricity, but apparently these caused some difficulties, and although they were improved after the first year, by 1897 all the cars on the coastal line had been converted to the trolleys that we see today. We perhaps rather tend to take these trams for granted here on the Isle of Man. After all, we can see them almost any day running between Douglas and Ramsey. So it's as well to remember that when this system was being designed and built, it was considered to be truly pioneering. Indeed, the technical press of both Britain and the United States took a keen interest in what was happening here. And those early engineers obviously got it right because these trams from the 1890s have now run more than a million track miles each and they're still going today. In the early years of the tramway, literally hundreds of thousands of people came to hear the village of Laxey. There were various reasons for this. First of all, of course, it was where the trams brought them, and there was still great novelty in travelling on this system. Also, Laxey was the centre of the island's mining industry. For decades, lead and silver had been brought up from deep underground. But there was also another reason, the Snaefell Mountain Railway. This was built in a period of just nine months in 1895. It was and still is the only electric mountain railway in Britain. It runs for over four miles inland on a gradient of one in 12 and rises to a height of 2,000 feet, just 36 feet below the summit of Snay Fell. The six cars ordered in 1895 are still in use today, although number five was substantially rebuilt in 1971. Until 1977, all the cars retained their original motors. Quite an achievement. In that year, though, it was necessary to do some refurbishing, and controllers and motors from the dismantled Aachen system in West Germany were bought and installed. At that time, rheostatic brakes were also installed, 
and you can see the equipment for them on the roofs of the cars. The cars on the mountain section go up on the outside and come down on the inside, driving on the right all the time. The gauge of the mountain track is 3 foot 6, as opposed to the 3 foot of the coastal section. And this extra 6 inches is to accommodate this rail here. It's called the fell rail, and such a rail was often used on steam mountain railways to give extra assistance to the engine by the addition of powered wheels which pressed against the rail. But the electric cars of 1895 were sufficiently advanced in design to be quite capable of handling the 1 in 12 gradients of this track without such assistance. So this rail was installed more for reasons of safety than anything else. It's actually a double-headed rail laid on its side, bolted to chairs, which in turn are bolted to the sleepers. Each of the bogies on the cars have a pair of horizontal wheels on their inner end. And although they aren't powered, they run against the track and they act as a guide and give the car much greater stability and prevent any serious derailment. The cars are also fitted with fell brakes, which supplement the ordinary brakes on the eight wheels. They're fitted at the outer ends of the cars and when applied, they grip the rail on either side like a pair of pincers. They can be applied by hand, but since the addition of the rear static braking system, the fell brakes aren't used regularly, but they are there in the case of an emergency. The cars retain their bow collectors. Trolleys were never installed. In the high winds sometimes experienced on the mountain, the bows have a better chance of staying in contact with the overhead cable and can't be blown off. The mountain railway was also an instant success and in its first weeks of operation was carrying 900 people a day all the way to the summit of Snaefell for the panoramic views. Apart from the mining and the mountain railway, there was one other reason why people flooded into the village of Laxey. They came to see a legendary miracle of Victorian engineering. And it towers above the village on a northwest hill. And it's quite simply the biggest water wheel in the world. If you've never been to the great Laxey wheel, or the Lady Isabella as she was named, then no description can adequately prepare you for what you'll see. 
It's not just that she's big, and there's no denying that she is, but it's that she can combine her size with such grace and elegance and thorough mechanical practicality. She was built in 1854 to pump the water from the lower reaches of the lead mines that honeycomb the land around Laxey. And now, over 130 years later, she's still turning. When you're standing on the platform at the top, you're 72 feet above the ground and you'll have climbed 95 steps to get there. By an ingenious design, water is forced up the tower at the back by gravity. It then runs along inside the platform on the top and falls onto the wheel at the end. From the back of the wheel, there's a series of arches which run some 200 yards up the valley. And on top of these runs a rod which is connected at one end to the wheel and at the other end to a huge tea rocker which at one time was connected to the pumping mechanism deep underground. The rod has recently been restored by the Manx government who now own the wheel and this is part of an imaginative scheme to open up more of the area to the public. It's a brilliant piece of design, a perfect balance between the functional, aesthetic and engineering requirements. And what did you do when you got here? Well, of course, you climbed to the top. Ninety, ninety-one, ninety-two, ninety-three, ninety-four, 95. Well, when you got here, there were superb views across the valley. Down there in the 1890s, you'd have seen the washing floors where the ore was crushed and sorted. You might also have seen two very small steam trains, the ant and the bee, that ran on a 19-inch gauge and that were used to haul the ore from deep inside the mine. Across the Laxey Valley there, there's the mountain railway making its way to the top of Snaefell. And down below us, at the front of the wheel, there was another Victorian novelty. From just here ran the Browside Tramway, a little incline railway that brought people up the hill from the bottom to here at the foot of the wheel. It had two 20-seat toast-track cars and it was run on the water counterbalance system. A tank in the upper car was filled with water from the Laxey Wheel's tail race and this made it heavier than the lower car, so it went to the bottom, pulling the other one up. The top one was filled whilst the bottom one was emptied, and they exchanged places again, carrying people all the time. Water powered nearly everything in this valley. After the success of the Mountain Railway and the popularity of the Douglas to Laxey line, the next move was obvious, to press on north to Ramsey. This they did, and the line was finally completed in 1899. On this final stretch of the journey, the tramway goes through some of the most varied scenery of the whole route. Above Bulgham Bay, the track reaches its highest point on the coastal section, nearly 600 feet above sea level.
Later on, the cliffs give way to the majestic backdrop of the northern mountains. This whole tram system must have been something of an experience for the hundreds of thousands of working class people that poured into the Isle of Man in the early years of this century. Because the sorts of trams they were used to were the ones that trundled through the streets of the big cities, taking them to and from work. They looked more like double-decker buses, and they rarely came into scenery like this. This stretch of track is just midway between Laxey and Ramsey. And when the line was being built, it was decided that this was an ideal place for another power station. Although it's not used today, the building is still here below the track, and you can see it as you go past on the tram. There's no road to it, though. Coal for the boilers was delivered by the trams themselves, and water was supplied by a fast-flowing stream that goes past the door. By 1935, though, the tramway was taking its power from the island's supply, and the power stations were stripped of their machinery and their halls left empty. Some of them are used as substations, though, to rectify the island's current from AC to DC, but most of them stand as memorials to those early pioneering days of electricity in the Isle of Man. In Laxey, though, a special rectifier house was built in 1935, and the equipment installed then, over half a century ago, is still used today. Large marble slabs act as insulators for the main power switches, which are highly polished copper and brass. But the main point of interest is in the cabinets which stand at the end of the hall. For in here are the mercury arc rectifiers which transform the current. They look like something from out of Dr. Frankenstein's laboratory, with their protruding wires and bubbling mercury. Underneath each glass container is a wooden fan which keeps the mercury cool. They were installed by the Huetic Electric Company. And so the trams eventually reach the suburbs of Ramsey and run right on into the centre of the town. At the end of the line in Ramsey, there's a fascinating museum devoted to the tramway and on display, rolling stock and machinery from its decades of operation. The museum is operated by the Isle of Man Railway Society. So that's the system as it stands today, ahead of its time when it was built, and now almost the sole survivor of a bygone age. The trams continue to run from town to town through the countryside, as they've done for a period now fast approaching a century. And we can only hope that they'll continue to do so long into the future. The island's narrow-gauge steam railway was already built by the time that work had started on the electric tramway. The principles of steam traction and the technicalities of running the iron horse across the countryside were already well established. The system as it stands today, though, is somewhat smaller than it once was. The first line was opened in 1873, and it ran across the island from Douglas to Peel. A line south to Port Erin followed the next year. Six years later, a 16-and-a-half-mile branch from St John's to Ramsey was opened, 
and a further branch line to the small mining village of Foxdale was opened in 1886. But these northern lines fell upon hard times. The Foxdale line was closed in 1940 and the Peel and Ramsey lines in 1968. The tracks have been ripped up, many of the stations demolished and the gatehouses turned into small private houses. Thankfully though, the southern section is still operating and a great deal of the original rolling stock and buildings are still in use today. The station here at Douglas consists of a large red brick building which was built in the 1890s and has an imposing entrance with clock and gold leaf domes on either side. The large entrance hall and spacious offices recall those days when the railways were more extensive than they are today and the trains leaving the Douglas platforms for north, west and south could sometimes have as many as a thousand passengers on board. The engines were built by the Bear Peacock Company of Manchester and of an original 15, four still survive today and there are others that could be rebuilt. Well in the driving cab here is Paul Ogden who's the assistant rolling stock supervisor and he's going to show us over this Bear Peacock engine. Hello Paul. Hello there. Now the first thing to ask you is technically they're known as 240 side tanks. What does that mean exactly? Well the 240 refers to the wheel arrangement. There's two leading wheels which we call a pony truck and four main driving wheels. And they're the ones that are powered? They're the ones that are powered, yes. And the side tanks, one of which we can see here, what are they for? These side tanks carry water, uh, as you can see, mounted on the side of the locomotive. That uh, makes the engine very compact, because presumably you don't need to pull a tender then? No, it? we don't pull mm. a tender. And the coal is kept in the cab with you? Yes, there's a mm. bunker in the cab for coal. Well, let's have a look in the cab. Perhaps you can show us how to drive a steam engine. Certainly. Well, the first thing to say, Paul, is that there's not much room in here, is there? No, not a great deal. For you and the farmer. Now, how does he get the fire going in the morning? Well, what we do is, first of all, check the level of water in the boiler, which we do by looking at these gauges here. Then we use paraffin rags, wood and coal, throw them all into the firebox and throw in a match in effect. And there's the fire in there. So you don't use fire lighters? No, we don't use fire lighters. And um, you let the fire go out every night, do you, overnight? Yes, the fire's mm. cleaned out every night before the engine's put away and then relit fresh in the morning. So what's that big lever you've got your hand on there? Ah, uh, this one. This controls the forward and reverse movement of the engine. That's now in forward gear. Mm. And what actually makes the engine go forward? How do you regulate the steam? By this regulator valve here, which equates to the throttle on a car. The more I open this lever, the more steam gets to the cylinders, the more power the engine has. And you put it into forward before you regulate the steam on? That's the right, on. yes. You select your gear and then put the throttle over. And what about the brakes? Well, on the, on the railway here we have a vacuum brake system and this is operated from this ejector set here. And that actually also is connected to some of the carriages, isn't it? That's right. Some yeah. of the carriages have uh, vacuum chambers and cylinders which operate the brakes on the carriage. The engine itself has a steam brake which is also operated through this unit. That applies the brakes, move the lever up, and that'll release them. Mm. And the all-important whistle, of course. How do you operate that? Ah, the whistle, yes. Here we are. Great. Well, let's uh, have a look outside again and see how the steam gets around the engine. Right. Well, Paul, on the outside here, perhaps you could show us the route the steam takes to um, get into the driving piston here. Well, it starts from under this brass dome here. Underneath that, that's just purely a cosmetic cover, is a steel dome which is part of the boiler. In there is what we call the regulator valve. The steam passes through the regulator valve along a series of pipes till it arrives at the cylinder. The steam then pushes on one end of the piston, forcing it back, which in turn pushes these rods and turns the wheel. So there must be quite a pressure in there. What sort of pressure is it? The boiler pressure is 160 pounds per square inch. By the time it arrives at the cylinders, it's probably around about 120, 140 pounds per square inch. Now what about this piece of mechanism here? Ah, this is the mechanical lubricator, which pumps heavy oil into the cylinders, L lubricates them as the engine's travelling along. So what's in the rest of this uh, large characteristic shape of the engine? Well, this is the actual boiler itself. 
and in there is steam and water. And how far does the water come up inside? The water level will approximately come to here and from there on up, steam. And what about excess steam? If you want to literally let off steam, does that come out of the, uh, the front as well as the black coal smoke? No, that happens automatically. We have safety valves up there, which when the pressure uh, gets over 160 pounds, will automatically lift and release that. At the far end of the platform are the workshops for the railway, and here the skilled staff can undertake all the maintenance and rebuilding work necessary to keep the railway running. The various lathes, saws and other machinery are all powered from an overhead spindle, and are connected to it by belts. Carpenters are on hand and they can, if necessary, rebuild an entire carriage. Here we see the engine Hutchinson stripped down for an overhaul. Well, to cope with all the trains in and out of Douglas Station in those days, this signal box was built in 1892. It was fitted with a rare spring handle lever frame system made by Duttons of Worcester. The levers have long since been disconnected, but they're still inside and still worth a look. This is a 36 lever frame and it incorporates Dutton's patent spring handle lever. The interlocking mechanism underneath ensured that no combination of levers could be pulled which might allow two trains to converge or a train to go to the wrong platform. The black levers were for the points and you pull those first. You then lock that in position with the appropriate red lever and then you could pull a blue lever for the signal. Today, the line has a mixture of modern and not-so-modern signalling. Leaving Douglas Station, there are coloured lights.
Just down the track at Port Sodrick, there's an early windlass system, the principle of which dates from the earliest days of steam in the 1840s. Operation of the mechanism locks the points for safety. At Balasella, there's a modern level crossing, with the gates being opened and closed remotely by a wheel. But in the depths of the countryside, the traditional methods are still employed. At the southern end of the line is the fishing village of Port Erin, which nestles in a westerly facing bay. It's long been a popular holiday resort, with its safe beaches and relaxed atmosphere. And it's here that the trains pull in at the end of the journey. On the return to Douglas, though, the engines have to run backwards, as a turntable was never installed on the southern line, and so at Port Erin, the engine changes ends. There's also another Victorian red brick station at Port Erin, built from Ruaban brick, which was brought to the island as ballast for the barges returning to Laxey to collect ore from the mines in the last century.
Most of the line is single track, with passing places at the stations, and a system of staff and ticket operate to ensure two trains don't meet on a single stretch. The driver must exchange the correct staff or ticket with the station master before he can proceed. The coaching stock that's used today dates from between 1881 and 1926, and it's still in excellent condition. Although comfortable, the interiors of most of the carriages are simply furnished. But there are some carriages which have been lavishly upholstered and decorated. These are used on special occasions, such as royal visits. The diamond and plate frames and the suspension can be seen underneath. At Port Erin there's another railway museum, this one dedicated to the steam system. Here you can see other engines that were once in use on the island, early rolling stock, and a comprehensive display of tickets. The museum was established and is run by the Passenger Transport Department, with assistance from the Isle of Man Railway Society who donated many of the items. Well, our little trains might not be quite as big and impressive as some of the great steam trains that run the rails elsewhere in the world, but they do inspire a great deal of affection in all who travel in them, and they're often the butt of good-natured humour like the story of the old Manxman from the south of the island who decided to emigrate to New Zealand. He started his journey by coming to Douglas, and when he got here, the station master asked him if he was going across. And when he learnt that a much longer journey was anticipated, he said, well, Harry, Auckland's a long way, you take care of yourself. A long way it might be, replied Harry, but thank God the worst of the journey's over. The railways have had a chequered history as companies, and they've had more than their fair share of threat of closure. But nowadays, the steam and electric systems are owned by the Manx government and the horse trams by the Douglas Corporation. So hopefully, their future is secure. But like all systems, they do need to be used. And there's one thing for sure. If you come to the Isle of Man, you'll be able to experience an extraordinary cross-section of vintage transport. And I guarantee that the journey will be well worthwhile. <laughs>